let us all know. There it is. And then um, we will uh, be happy to um, take some time at the end to um, for questions and discussion. So um, if anyone does have questions, you can put them in the chat or you can wait till the end and we'll open it up. Um, but yeah, I think we'll, uh, we're at 11, so uh, we can get going here. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm Megan Mayola Heath. I'm with the Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed. And we also have Daniel Bowker here. So um, I'll let Daniel introduce himself and a little bit about CPRW and our forestry work. Awesome. Thank you, Megan. Good morning, everybody. Daniel Bowker, Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed. I believe I know most of you all, thank you very much for joining us on a Monday morning. Um, CPRW does a bunch of work with uh, the communities in the upper Poudre watershed, um, both uh, on our own and as part of the Northern Colorado Fire Shed Collaborative. And one of the things we've been working really hard on over the past couple of years is kind of a community-led um, CWPP process, community wildfire uh, protection planning process, where the communities really go through their own analysis of risk, of wildfire risk, and uh, things like evacuation planning and home ignition zone planning and landscape scale forestry work planning and all that kind of thing face um, the, the risks and the opportunities of living in a fire prone part of our watershed. Um, we have a, a great guest with us today, Jacob Hedorn Gorski. He is um, a uh, landscape architecture student uh, just finished up at the University of Amsterdam and uh, Jacob picked our area the Red Feather Lakes Crystal Lakes area as a really interesting example of how we might live in a landscape that has more fire and uh, I will pretty much just let Jacob take it from here but I would li love to uh, have a little discussion at the end if we have time um, but yeah go for it Jacob tell us uh, who you are and how you found us and uh, how Sarah connected us, all that kind of thing will be a great part of the story. I'm gonna get the whole sound to go through. Sure, of course. Yeah, thank you, uh, first of all, Daniel and Megan for uh, for setting this up. Uh, it's great to sort of have a chance to present my work to sort of uh, mm -hmm. such a broad audience. Uh, and I sort of, I'm, I'm American myself, I uh, grew up sort of in California, Wisconsin and Connecticut, uh, so bounced uh, around a little bit. Uh, and I've been living in Amsterdam now for the last six years. And I uh, actually sort of uh, landed in Colorado for my graduation project. Uh, thanks to one of the committee members for my thesis, that's Sarah. And I was part of the, the Fort Collins uh, Rocky Mountain uh, Research Station. So she uh, pointed me right to sort of where uh, where there was some, uh, some room for new ideas. So I appreciate that connection uh, and sort of the, the places that it's led me. I might share my screen. Let's see if it uh, if it works for all of you guys. Let's see. Can you guys uh, see something here? Um, I oh, just I gave you screen sharing. Sorry. Okay, there you go. Perfect. Yeah, we can see that. Great. Let me uh, do full screen here. Yeah. So the project I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, tonight my time this morning your time uh, is sort of a thesis uh, master's project uh, that I completed uh, here in Amsterdam uh, with a landscape architectural perspective and like Daniel was saying I sort of looked at um, how we can actually live in a future where fire uh, perhaps is more present in the landscape than it has been in the past and fire is sort of something that's uh, yeah. been quite fascinating to me ever since my childhood. Like I had mentioned, I, I grew up uh, in Wisconsin, sort of on the ro rolling uh, prairie hills uh, nearby Madison. And uh, most days after my after school, my brother and I would uh, sort of use this uh, prairie landscape as our giant backyard playground, sort of building stick forts, chasing turkeys, constructing forts. Um, but then every year the, the prairie, which was managed, uh, was also burnt. And so this entire playscape that my brother and I had built up burned alongside with it. And sort of through these early childhood memories, I started to um, appreciate fire not only as a destructive force in the landscape, but also as a necessary part of the landscape uh, and part of its renewal uh, as sort of the spring grasses poked out from beneath the ashes. Uh, and I sort of realized in this childhood that I, uh, the, the landscape that I built this playscape needed to burn uh, in order that it could sort of be enjoyed again uh, the following year. And I brought these sort of early fascinations with landscape through my life uh, to the point where I decided to 
uh, work and study in uh, in Amsterdam, uh, where I'm currently working for the city of Amsterdam on a sort of urban expansion project, sort of a series of uh, artificial islands in the east of the city, um, and really steeping myself in uh, the Dutch design tradition uh, through my work and my studies here. So when I was asked to do, uh, or asked sort of what my thesis uh, topic would be, wildfire was a really interesting one, not just only because of my own personal fascination, um, but also because of connections I saw between wildfire and uh, sort of the natural enemy the Dutch have been fighting, uh, uh, which is water. Um, and the Dutch sort of had taken a very defensive approach to water, sort of building dikes, uh, building essentially a, a giant engineered machine landscape to keep uh, the groundwater uh, level below the ground itself. Uh, but in recent years, they've developed a much more sort of nuanced, uh, different attitude towards wildfire and you see, or towards flooding and uh, water. And Weird. you see that in projects like this one showing here on the screen, uh, where they've actually uh, sort of in here a river that has had historically flooded, uh, building sort of new uh, flood channels where the river was given room to sort of expand and fluctuate and breathe. Um, and not only from a functional sense, but also introducing elements like these stepping stones, which you see here, where visitors can actually experience these uh, flooded landscapes instead of only seeing it as a threat. Um, and so for me, this sort of uh, parallel between, between water and fire was really interesting, and especially the of applying sort of this Dutch attitude uh, towards uh, wildfire in the U.S., and early on in my research, I sort of traveled to different parts of the world that were experiencing uh, wildfire to Calero uh, Colorado, but also to Catalonia. Um, and I quickly realized that sort of how, like with water, uh, we can't look at wildfire without recognizing this uh, greater context in which it burns. Um, and part of this is a cultural context, uh, sort of wildfire is deeply related to policies, institutions, uh, land management practices, and more. Um, and it's also related to the landscape in which uh, the fire burns. And so part of this is that landscape shapes fire. I won't go into detail here because I think uh, you're all fairly familiar, uh, but wildfire can sort of really react to topography and wind uh, and sort of the composition of a landscape. Uh, but fire can also shape landscape in return. Uh, it can sort of change the way a forest is structured or spaced uh, and it can do that in the way of burning in different uh, sort of patterns uh, across that landscape from the ground uh, to the surface and to the crown uh, of a forest. And so when I uh, was sort of doing this research with sort of the, the advice of, uh, of Sarah, sort of really zooming into uh, Colorado and particularly the Front Range, because uh, these are areas of sort of uh, historically fire American West, uh, but Colorado, which I'll get into shortly, was uh, of particular uh, interest, uh, in particularly the Front Range Mountains. So the Front Range Mountains sort of have a varied uh, topography, um, and because of this have uh, sort of different types of forests that exist in uh, the Front Range Mountains. You have sort of in, in lower elevations, uh, montane forests, which are kind of more mixed open conifer forests, uh, and then with a gradient, uh, as you move up in elevation, uh, you move up to higher uh, subalpine forests, which are much denser conifer forests that burn less frequently, uh, but much more intensely when they do burn. Uh, and in between these forest types, you have mountain streams that uh, provide important ecosystem services, but also drinking water uh, and other qualities to, uh, to the landscape and its, uh, and its residents. And these different forests that exist on the Front Range uh, have different uh, historical fire regimes. Like I mentioned, montane forests have a much more open structure, uh, burn more intensely, but with light to moderate fire. And in these forests, uh, wildfire really maintains this sort of open savanna-like structure and also creates sort of new important uh, successionary habitats for species uh, important to these ecosystems. On the other hand, you see here a timeline of uh, how fire burns in subalpine forests. Um, and you see when a fire burns, it uh, can often replace an entire stand or a large part of the stand of the forest, uh, clearing out most of the forest and actually uh, having it regrow uh, and, and reestablish over a much longer time frame. 
And when I was uh, sort of looking into these different forests and their different ecosystems, I sort of saw that there's three very general strategies that plants and animals had in these uh, ecosystems, and I think more generally in, in uh, fiery ecosystems around the world. Uh, you have certain species that uh, are resilient to wildfire, to start on the right side. Uh, these are species that can get burnt, but can also survive getting burnt and maybe even reestablish quicker because they have uh, been burnt. Uh, those are species like the ponderosa pine, uh, also species like the elk that come back and forage uh, shortly after a fire has burnt. Um, you have another sort of classification of species that are resistant to wildfire. These are species that actively build up defensive uh, sort of maneuvers to deal with wildfire, uh, whether it's sort of the moist uh, green leaves and tw thick twigs uh, of aspen trees or uh, beavers that build dams that uh, inadvertently or not shield them from wildfire. And the last category of species I saw were species that were actually dependent on wildfire. These are species that need the heat and effects of wildfire to, uh, to grow and to thrive. So species like the lodgepole pine, whose pine cones explode uh, and reseed only with the heat of wildfire, or species like the black-backed woodpecker, uh, which sort of jumps from burn forest to burn forest, uh, scavenging uh, food. And because of sort of these different forest types and these different strategies that existed sort of in the front range, uh, you really have what I kind of call here an amphitheater of the afterlife that exists in these uh, post-fire uh, landscapes where you have these like really um, almost sublime experiences uh, walking through these burnt forests and also really poetic traces that fires leave behind. Whether it's sort of here in this photo, you see uh, granite rock uh, that cracked under the heat of the fire. So you have these brilliant white piles of stones in the middle of a charred landscape. Um, and also moments like here where you see sort of the void left behind by a tree's uh, rooting system and trunk. So walking through this landscape, you're playing detective a little bit, sort of finding traces and, and seeing how the landscape uh, reacts and responds to these uh, fires. And it's also sort of an experience that is actually not uh, available to the public uh, that much. But uh, as I think a lot of you know, sort of this now has been a very rosy history of, of wildfire. Um, but of course, uh, this, this history is complex and has been changing uh, over, over the years. Uh, here you see sort of a, a timeline uh, at the top with sort of an indication of the presence of wildfire through this red line. Um, and you see sort of in particularly in the 20th century onwards, wildfire was denied sort of its, its natural historical uh, function and place on these landscapes through sort of active policy uh, and forest management. Um, and that has led to sort of fires like the present, uh, that we're experiencing the present, like the 2020 uh, Cameron Peak fire uh, that are burning much larger and much more intensely and much more destructively uh, than uh, these fires used to burn. As you could say, sort of the fires we're seeing now are fires that are debts that we're repaying through these uh, years of, uh, of management. Um, and there, these new fires are burning in ways that often these uh, forest ecosystems, which are adapted to wildfire, uh, are not able to sort of buffer or uh, recover. Uh, so you have a lot of cases where fires, particularly in severely burnt areas, um, convert the forest into shrublands, close off a landscape uh, to recreation and to other access, uh, and have uh, numerous other damaging uh, ecosystem and infrastructure effects that can last for years, even after the fire uh, burnt. And at the same time as these fires are uh, burning more increasingly in places like Colorado and in the American West, um, a lot of these places are also uh, increasingly urbanizing uh, and growing as cities expand into these landscapes. And that's one thing that made the Front Range also very interesting to me. Uh, is sort of how fast Colorado as a state is growing and how closely these centers of growth are located next to these uh, combustible landscapes. Uh, and so you have sort of this uh, tension uh, or, set, or, or clash that's sort of looming in the, in the future where you have more and more people relying on a landscape and its ecosystem services. Um, but this landscape is also burning uh, more frequently and more intensely uh, than it has in the last hundred years. And these pressures uh, on the Front Range, I thought, really came together in mountain towns like uh, Red Feather Lakes, 
uh, and Crystal Lakes. Um, these are towns uh, that really rely on these landscapes for, for recreation. Other towns where residents might move there because of its natural beauty and where at least the residents I, I met all really had sort of a very deep relationship with the landscape uh, around them. And so sort of I, I figured with this project, it seems like we're at an, an impasse uh, or a point where the status quo is not sustainable. Uh, the way we've been managing our forests over the last hundred years uh, is leading to increasingly defensive measures um, and measures that don't really take into account the full uh, potential and complexity of wildfire, uh, but that also might just exacerbate this clash uh, that's set uh, and looming before us. And so what and so if we what sort of look towards the, the Dutch uh, and see how we can actually transform uh, wildfire from what, how it's seen as a threat into also maybe an opportunity where it doesn't only lead to destruction, but might also offer new landscape experiences, new habitats, and a richer experience uh, with the landscape around us. And part of that will be reintegrating wildfire within this larger context, which I think over the last 100 years, uh, we've largely forgotten, uh, sort of working with wildfire through policy, through land use, um, and through uh, community participation and involvement in their landscape. And so my project to sort of explore this question of how, how would this new approach to wildfire look like, um, I sort of selected three sites uh, on sort of the border and area around Crystal Lakes uh, and Red Feather Lakes. Uh, the first site here is an unburnt subalpine forest that has a high risk of uh, wildfire. The second site here is one of these mountain streams on the border of Crystal Lakes and a subalpine forest. And the last site here is a uh, site that was burnt in the 2020 Cameron Peak Fire uh, just on the outskirts of Red Feather Lakes. And sort of this, this area that I'm zooming into uh, was interesting me to me for a number of reasons. Um, you have sort of mixed ownership on this site. So you have private property, uh, but also public forests. Um, you have sort of an intense uh, recreational pressure on these forests, a lot of paths leading in and out of these towns that are used uh, by residents, uh, but also by uh, weekend visitors from cities like Fort Collins or Denver. Uh, you have uh, actually on this site uh, is the, the border between these two forest systems that I had mentioned, the subalpine forest and the montane forest. So you have different uh, ecologies, but also different historical fires that burnt uh, in this same site. And the last, uh, and this is a bit difficult to read, um, but here you see sort of in dark, this is the burn perimeter of the 2020 Cameron Peak fire, uh, which burnt partially in the site, uh, and also more generally wind from the um, southwest that uh, pushes uh, any potential fire from these forests uh, smack into the town. So it has uh, a lot of sort of uh, layers to this landscape. And my approach with this project was actually to look at sort of this conclusion I had drawn from the local uh, ecology, um, sort of these three strategies that I had seen, um, and actually translate each strategy, uh, generally speaking, into a strategy for one of the sites. Uh, and in doing so, allowing it, a wildfire to tell uh, a new story and provide new experiences of this landscape that maybe uh, don't exist on it today. And also I looked how to sort of maybe invert the way we approach wildfire uh, now from sort of the, the current status quo where wildfire is uh, largely sort of a, relegated to a domain of expertise. Um, and when a wildfire happens, it's sort of in that realm. And then uh, the rest of the stakeholders are, are sort of excluded from that process to one where maybe uh, we broaden our definition of firefighters uh, and community participation uh, to actually include a more diverse set of stakeholders in this process. So the first site is uh, here. This is the burnt or unburnt uh, subalpine forest uh, that I'd mentioned. Uh, here you see sort of a, just a simple map of it. So it's uh, largely forest with some mountain roads uh, and recreational trails uh, like here going through the site. And um, what I had actually heard from a resident uh, who, was, who was hiking on, on a trail nearby here when I bumped into him 
I was, he was complaining about how these subalpine forests are uh, quote unquote two dimensional. Uh, so they're either overcrowded uh, and unhealthy uh, with pests like the mountain pine beetle uh, impacting a lot of these forests, or you have a forest that's been completely burnt and charred uh, and is maybe closed off to the public. Um, and he was asking sort of how, is there maybe a third dimension? Is there maybe something in between that can exist? And sort of that comment stuck with me when I was looking at this site as well. And so for this site, I actually wanted to repurpose an existing uh, tool that exists sort of in, in in uh, the firefighting world, and that's uh, the fire break. Um, and largely when you see a fire break, it's really sort of a, a static line going in, in the landscape, sort of in a strip where trees and other vegetation is cleared to keep wildfire from spreading uh, from one side of the forest to the other. So really compartmentalizing the forest. But these uh, fire breaks, uh, I noticed in many cases weren't uh, designed to sort of move with the forest. They weren't designed to burn with the forest. And they also didn't add a lot of ecological value to the forest either. Um, and so I wanted to look at, could I make sort of a bespoke or custom fire break uh, for the subalpine forest? Uh, one that maybe just didn't have a, a firefighting goal, um, but one that sort of developed a deeper relationship with the forest structure, with its ecology, uh, one that provided maybe new opportunities for recreation uh, and for art and for other experience uh, in the landscape. So the fire break 2.0, I call it here. And so here I'm going to show you sort of a couple of uh, sections of, of this fire break, uh, kind of transforming over time. Um, and so in the in the first stage, I actually ask the, the community, along with uh, organizations like the U.S. Forest Service, to help uh, make these forest uh, fire breaks together. Uh, and the wood that's harvested here uh, will be used in other points of the project. We'll get back to that. Um, but I asked the community to sort of take a, take a role in this uh, from the beginning. Uh, next to fire breaks, I also introduce uh, sort of other elements in the landscape, a kind of lookout towers here uh, that are then placed in the forest uh, and provide sort of a, a point of interest along forest trails uh, for visitors to experience. And these fire breaks uh, help so that when part of the subalpine forest burns, uh, the burn is uh, sort of con uh, sort of uh, contained into uh, just the part of the uh, part of the forest behind the fire break, and that it doesn't expand or continue to burn into uh, the the rest of the forest. Uh, and what you'll see here is I also uh, let the lookout towers burn here uh, as well, and that's because I uh, actually had envisioned these lookout towers is actually uh, a bit inspired by these pine cones from trees like the lodgepole pine that are sort of built to burn. Um, and so the idea with these sort of monuments, I call them, was that you have sort of this, this skeletal uh, structure that remains after the fire is burnt uh, that provides a point of uh, interest and also sort of a trace of the forest that used to exist uh, after the fire burns. Uh, and so when people walk through these forests, they also have these, these powerful moments where they recognize uh, the trace of something that they maybe saw before the fire burnt. What's also important here is I designed the, the width of the fire break, not just to defend against wildfire, but I also looked at uh, aspects like the average sort of windborne seed distance from trees like the lodgepole pine so that the unburnt forest can actually more easily reseed the burnt forest, sort of speeding up and kickstarting this uh, uh, successionary process in subalpine forests. Uh, and perhaps in this early stage, uh, there can also be moments for uh, new forms of recreation, stuff like camping, uh, that's actually safer uh, because the landscape has actually recently burnt. And over time, sort of as this forest regrows, you see here kind of this, this monument tucked between the trees, um, the, this conversation can continue between the two sides of the forest, uh, that when, these, when this forest is mature enough, uh, it can also help reseed the, uh, the other forest when that forest eventually burns. And here you see sort of a, a schematic diagram of how this could look sort of in, in green here with the white dashed lines or sort of these network of open um, fire break spaces um, and sort of not just as a linear element, but something that really sort of uh, reacts to the topography of the landscape. Um, and also sort of ties into existing and new recreational 
trails, which you see here in orange, uh, that you can also really walk through this landscape and have moments with open clearings and dense subalpine forests um, that at the same time, when a forest burns or a compartment, uh, it won't burn the entire forest uh, with it. Here you see sort of a, a detail of how this fire break could look with the lighter areas being the, the open space and kind of the darker ones, the, the forest. And you see here how you can have sort of a very uh, varied uh, experience sort of with different stages of succession and fire uh, through a single landscape. Um, and these fire breaks uh, can also be designed in a way that they also provide uh, habitat for sort of important species that live on forest edges uh, in these subalpine forests that you can look at using it sort of also as um, an important uh, driver of habitat. Uh, and here you see sort of a collage uh, or sort of a, an impression of how it could look like walking through these uh, the recently burnt uh, subalpine forests and sort of being confronted with sort of these skeletal structures that remained uh, from the lookout towers. What's also uh, what I had failed to mention earlier is I also sort of in moments uh, create sort of paths through this forest and actually use granite stones for these paths. So the granite explodes after the fire and you sort of have these white paths also leading you through uh, this forest uh, also as a trace of the fire that used to burn there. And here you see sort of a, a model uh, that I made of my uh, of my project where I sort of incorporated this burnt smoky aesthetic into the model. Um, and it's a bit hard to see, but I actually also integrated a smoke machine into the base of the model. So uh, when you pump and press a button, you could sort of burn the landscape and sort of see uh, smoke rising and get that the, the sensory impression of what it's like to be uh, in this in this kind of eerie landscape. The second site here uh, is on the border of a, an unburned subalpine forest as well, um, and then a mountain stream and crystal lakes. Yeah, so here you see sort of a zoom in with sort of this the stream running through the middle uh, and uh, the border of the town here. Um, and here I sort of looked uh, at translating uh, sort of the defensive strategy that I saw in the landscape, um, because this is sort of a, a site that I thought is quite vulnerable. You have this unburned subalpine forest that can really burn intensely, uh, but also just on the other side of this valley, uh, sort of homes and infrastructure and in this in this town. So there's sort of a, yeah, a, a um, potential sort of risk there. Or, or vulnerability there that these fires can just burn uninterrupted into crystal lakes. Um, and so here I thought this is really a, sort of a, a site where uh, being defensive is, is necessary uh, to sort of protect residents from this uh, potential. Um, and so what I did here is sort of uh, uh, develop what I call the, the beaver buffer. So not a, a sort of a green fire break, but a, a blue fire break, you could say, with sort of water and, um, and streamside vegetation. Um, and actually using beavers and beaver dams to widen the stream bed uh, and also tie in sort of recreation uh, and sort of other layers to this intervention. And so in this site, I sort of broadened the traditional definition of firefighter, um, saying it doesn't only need to be humans who are fighting these fires, but why not sort of use natural landscape dynamics and qualities uh, to help us in the process. So what it, why don't we hire uh, trees like the aspen, who are already fire resistant, and in some cases can really stop uh, fires from spreading through their thick root systems. Uh, and what if we also hire firefighters like the beaver, who can sort of uh, increase uh, the sort of the stream bed uh, and and the potential of these streams to keep fires from jumping uh, across. And there's references of this uh, working in other places. Here you see sort of a um, sort of a beaver dam in uh, sort of in California in a in a fire that had burnt here the entire landscape burnt but you also see the potential of these places to sort of provide uh, a buffer in the landscape. I think this might be a bit hard to read on on the screen uh, but what I propose here is sort of from the left to the right uh, a timeline with different uh, phases where I sort of ask the community uh, sort of after uh, a wildfire to uh, install artificial beaver dams, uh, because beavers are actually sort of lazy animals, I learned. They prefer to move into existing dams before they build their own. So I thought, let's give them a, a head start here um, and give them some uh, space to, uh, to establish. 
Um, and while that's happening, also ask the community to plant uh, sort of fire resistant streamside vegetation like aspen uh, to sort of uh, broaden sort of the potential of this site to buffer fire. Um, and then over time, as beaver populations establish, uh, the, the next generation of beaver puffs uh, moves gradually upstream, uh, finding sort of new uh, places to build dams. And so you sort of uh, let this population and its uh, potential grow over time. Um, and the effect of this, uh, a bit speculative, but, uh, but, but I show here, is that sort of by widening this, this stream bed, you can also uh, limit the or, or decrease, decrease the risk that wildfire will actually jump this stream uh, to crystal lakes. And here you see sort of a schematic of the site with uh, sort of these uh, streams kind of coming together at this border here, um, and also sort of moments uh, here uh, where there's potential for, for beaver dams uh, to establish and sort of create wetter zones. And sort of through this uh, beaver buffer, I also uh, drew here sort of an orange a rear, uh, sort of path um, that connect, uh, connects partially to existing paths um, where residents from Crystal Lakes could easily go and walk their dog or go for a jog or a bike ride along here as well. So it's not just something for fire, but it's really sort of a, a new park or a recreational space uh, for Crystal Lakes and for, for Red Lakes as well. Uh, here you see sort of a, a section drawing in front of how these uh, dams could look and the different species that could uh, populate uh, the stream and uh, the streamside uh, areas. And here you see sort of a, um, a collage of what it could look like uh, to walk sort of through this new landscape where you're seeing sort of uh, moments where beavers established, but also uh, areas in the far distance where you see these subalpine forests uh, burning. What you also see here is that sort of uh, some of the wood that's harvested in the previous site is actually used to create these uh, artificial beaver dams. Um, and here I propose to actually burn uh, and scorch wood uh, stumps to create these dams because scorching uh, wood also makes it more rot resistant. So it has a, a functional uh, component to make it last longer, but also introduces sort of a fiery aesthetic into these sites. So even if this isn't burning, you can still sort of see uh, the fire uh, in one way or another. And then the last site, and then I'll uh, open it up to discussion, <laughs> is uh, the um, a partially burnt uh, site here on the outskirts of Red Feather Lakes. Uh, and here in black, you see sort of the burn perimeter of the 2020 Cameron Peak fire covering most of the site. Um, and here in this drawing, you see I actually mapped out the uh, sort of different burn severities of this uh, site. So the black is sort of severely burned areas, the gray is moderately burned, and the, the lightest gray here is um, lightly burnt. And so you see that in this site, uh, there's quite a few parts of the forest that, are, that have been severely uh, and moderately burnt. And where there's risk, uh, I think that these forests without our help might not uh, grow back. It's a little blurry, but you see photo photos like this, where even 20 years after a wildfire, uh, the forest is yet to reestablish. So you really have this risk that these forests kind of convert into a, diff a completely different kind of ecology, uh, where you lose habitats, of course, but also sort of this forest close to you. And so what I did in this site is sort of try to uh, interpret the resilient strategy uh, into this montane forest. Uh, to sort of look at how can I uh, ask for the local community, the residents of Red Feather Lakes who live close to this site, uh, to help restore the forest in the areas that it needs most. Uh, and in doing so, uh, can I create new moments for uh, education, um, sort of for, for replanting, uh, but also sort of a, a rich forest that reestablishes after this fire. And so here you see sort of another timeline from, from left to right, where you have the Cameron Peak fire, which burned in 2020. Um, and as the forest recovers, I, uh, together with residents and the Forest Service, uh, reopen a fire trail that connects uh, a lot of these very severely burnt patches in the forest. And via this trail, uh, ask sort of these groups to help uh, replant these areas with sort of new future proof uh, sapling variants. 
um, and over time install a sort of moments like sort of here you see an educational platform where visitors can sort of uh, interact with the landscape in new and exciting ways. Um, but unlike sort of previous years, once this uh, forest is established uh, to maturity, uh, I also ask sort of these uh, organizations and, and uh, participants also to take an active role in uh, maintaining this forest. So really uh, involving them with prescribed fire uh, and activities like that. And here you see um, sort of in orange, this line, you see uh, sort of the trail, the fire trail that I propose. Uh, and you can see it sort of links a lot of these severely burnt areas, these darker uh, areas. Um, and that provides sort of moments where you experience these dark burnt areas, but also uh, other stages of forest. Uh, so I actually asked the community to visit these landscapes uh, that they might not have the chance to easily visit uh, as it is. Um, and in this site, I also looked at sort of how uh, different uh, maintenance regimes can result in different montane forests. Uh, so using sort of a mixture of uh, uh, more mixed and moderate severity fire to uh, reduce sort of or produce a denser forest structure, but also uh, in other areas, um, maintaining sort of a slower severity fire regime to create kind of a more open forest. Uh, so the montane forest that reestablishes is not just one forest, but really a, a more resilient uh, patchwork that forms. And here you see sort of a, a graphic sort of showing here the path in the light line, uh, moving through sort of different sort of forests and different stages of succession, uh, but also in moments where the community can come together uh, and really maintain this forest. And here I have sort of a detail of how one of these uh, educational platforms uh, that I had mentioned could look like, um, where residents can sort of actually be elevated above the landscape, uh, maybe come in closer contact with the sort of the burned bark of ponderosa pines uh, and other species that are growing from these burnt landscapes. Um, but I also propose that actually sort of the, the panel here on the platform also uh, burns when there's prescribed burns. So you sort of have a, a trace of the uh, whole uh, history of maintenance in this forest that really lives in the platform and where you can go back and, and understand sort of the, the history that's happened here, even if you don't see it in the vegetation. And here you see sort of a, a collage as well, sort of showing uh, what it could look like, sort of walking through this, this actively managed montane forest. Um, and here you actually see sort of the photo of me and my brother from the beginning uh, with the idea that sort of with forests uh, and sort of with, with projects and opportunities like this, um, you can sort of let fire tell uh, stories to sort of future generations the same way that it's told uh, a story to me. Uh, and that sort of future residents uh, can come to sort of have this deeper uh, appreciation and relationship with the landscape through fire uh, instead of just uh, being afraid of it that I can skip. Um, yeah, and then uh, I want to say thank you. <laughs> that's that's my my presentation, uh, the, uh, the short version. Um, and I want to, yeah, again, thank uh, Daniel and Megan, as well as uh, Sarah for, for helping set this up and putting me in contact with you. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm very curious what you think of it. And I also, in case uh, you don't have any questions, have some sort of themes and, and ideas that I put up here uh, as well, things that sort of stuck with me in the project and where I think we could really uh, have a conversation about looking a bit closer uh, at the front range. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob. I just think that is, it's so fascinating and thought provoking. <clears throat> and I love um, the graphics, something about the conceptual nature of your graphics really helps get that point across. If you could go back maybe to that last one where you and your brother are there in the sure. landscape. I just think that's a, a really cool picture to kind of think through, you know, what is living in this landscape going to look like in the future? And uh, I, I definitely want to hear what some other folks have to say and questions and, and that kind of thing today. But a few things stand out to me here. I do remember uh, early on in the Cameron Peak fire response uh, after the fire was you know, controlled or, or contained, and we were thinking through post-fire recovery and that kind of thing. Um, I, we got an email through our uh, website that said, hey, can you send me an outline of where the fire burned so I can make sure I don't go hiking in those areas? 
And I thought how interesting that was. You know, we really still have um, this idea of the green wall of trees over there. That's where nature lives. Green is healthy. Anything different is wrong, you know. And so when that fire came through and you have those severely burned areas, to me, you know, working in a lot of the restoration work that we did and that kind of thing, being in those areas with the helicopters dropping the the mulch on the hillsides to slow erosion, you realize how fascinating some of those burned areas are and how worthy of aesthetic experience they are as well, you know, and getting past that idea of green is natural and that's healthy and anything else, you know, black is bad and we want to, we want to avoid it. And so that's, you know, that was a, a real uh, reminder of that, the way that we think. Um, and then something about the lines that you have, uh, in your in your schematics, I really love those because they're they're permeable. You know, these are not hard and fast control lines, and I think a lot of times that's exactly what we're thinking about. Um, that area over there is where one thing happens, and then we have this line, and then over here something totally different happens. Like we build our homes and have our evacuation routes and enjoy our area and that kind of thing, and over there is where. Um, fire happens or management happens or something like that, but realizing how permeable those lines are and realizing how that gives rise to different types of experience of living in these areas. And something we talked about early on is a lot of us managers, especially, we look at everything on an aerial photo or a map and it is two dimensional and we draw those lines on the map, but we don't think about what it's like to live there and to walk those lines? Or did that used to be a bike path and now it's overgrown? What if we manage the area? Or what if fire was able to come through here and do the good that it does? Then what kind of um, different or better or uh, some other quality of aesthetic experience do we get by moving through those areas? We don't experience them from the top in two dimensions. We experience them moving through them. So. Fascinating stuff. And, you know, those lines, that's all tied up with control. And a lot of what I think we see here is not lack of control, but a different type of control. We certainly want control of this landscape, but instead of just white knuckling our way through it and being like, well, this can only occur over there. Things have to occur across those boundaries and across those lines in a different type of control structure than we have built to this point. That includes things like, um, you know, wildfire, um, when it does the good that it can do, prescribed fire, those kinds of things. Beavers, you know, you don't tell a beaver what to do. You hope it'll do what you want it to do. So there's a different kind of control set up there. Um, just some thoughts I had, but love to get uh, other people's questions and, and comments and that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to look at the chat. Does anybody want to just turn your camera on and and say hi, ask Jacob a question, anything like that. Maybe I can quickly <laughs> respond to your uh, to, to some of the, the points you made first, and then I'll uh, want to hear what everybody else yeah, uh, please. has to say. Um, but yeah, your your point over graphics that was really sort of a, a search for me was sort of how to how to show these maybe in a more fluid way, but also in a less scary way. Because sort of one thing that really struck me, uh, sort of jumping into the fire world, was sort of how much of the conversation and, and language was dominated. Uh, uh, by fear, by risk, by fighting, right? It, it isn't the word firefighting. Um, but sort of if we're turning that story, that narrative on its head, or at least giving some nuance to it, also sort of finding new um, sort of graphical ways and, and design ways to also capture sort of the, the gentler side uh, of wildfire uh, as well. Um, Sorry. Yeah, and, and the points that you made about sort of control, that's uh, also something... Uh, that sort of uh, had uh, had occurred to me. Sort of, it, it wildfire touches sort of some very elemental uh, understandings we have of our landscape, particularly the American landscape. Uh, wilderness is also sort of a big concept that sort of wildfire touches or challenges or complicates. Right. Yes. Yeah. Certainly. Definitely. Um, there's a couple of points in the chat. Maybe I can bring those up and, and just get your reaction to those. Uh, Zoe asks about um, how do the fire breaks take into consideration ember cast and spot fires? And I thought one of your graphics had uh, something about, you know, embers and spot fires and that kind of thing. And how do you see, again, it's kind of the permeability of those lines, right? Yeah, let me zoom out. Uh, yeah, so uh, 
Good question. I think to, to preface, it's it's good to say that a lot of this project um, sort of I, I drew from sort of existing knowledge and research and, and guidance, uh, but a lot of it is also quite speculative. Um, there's just not a lot of sort of uh, information and, and, and references out there. Uh, so I can't say for certain that this will uh, contain the fire or stop uh, spotting or, or sort of um, expansion from, from wind. Uh, but the idea was sort of by compartmentalizing the subalpine forest, even if it spreads from one compartment to the other, uh, it keeps it from just burning uh, uninterrupted and unimpeded through the entire forest. Um, and I think sort of looking at the exact widths and locations uh, and composition uh, of these breaks is something that then would really need to be done uh, in close cooperation with, with foresters and sort of other stakeholders. Um, but the general idea is that sort of these compartments uh, when they burn naturally or not, we really let them burn uh, and sort of seed some of this control that we uh, have in the current uh, sort of context. Um, so in that sense, I'm sort of, I'm not, I would say it's easy for me to say here, but it's it's not necessarily a bad thing if this fire spreads from one compartment to the other, uh, but that you have this sort of uh, more resilient uh, mesh or, or matrix that can absorb uh, sort of a fire or prevent it from burning uh, sort of at uh, a size that is uh, dangerous, but also a size that sort of uh, ecologically and historically uh, is bigger than it burnt at. Yeah, yeah, great point, great point. And a lot of us are involved on the planning side with uh, something that the Forest Service and researchers are calling pods or potential operational delineations. I don't know if you've heard about that process, but it's a really interesting parallel to the the pathways and the lines that you have kind of conceptually drawn um, as ways that we move through the forest here. We have been thinking about those as, you know, this compartment, if it were to burn, those pod lines around it are the areas where we could possibly get a handle on or help, you know, contain or control that fire within that pod. And we've been talking a lot uh, lately, especially with the communities up in Crystal Lakes and Red Feather Lakes, about where those pod lines are and how we see, if a fire were to move through that landscape, where are these locations where we could possibly contain it? What do those look like on the ground? Are they evacuation routes? Are they borders between forest types? You know, um, do they use old burns? Um, all that kind of thing. Do they use beaver, beaver habitat, streams, that kind of thing as ways to, to change that fire behavior as it moves across the landscape? And it seems to me that this goes hand in hand with that. You know, if we are focusing on those pod lines as a way to compartmentalize the landscape, then why don't those lines serve another purpose, which is recreational or aesthetic or, you know, like we mentioned a, a, a while back, a, a pathway through the forest that may have been lost over time through that forest growing in. But if it's going to be a pod line and you're going to do a fuel break there anyway, how about have it? have some kind of aesthetic interest or recreational interest so you can use that area at the same time. Um, exactly. And yeah. in each of my sites, I sort of also uh, sort of looked for some sort of intervention where the first win wasn't even the, the fire safety component, but sort of a new recreational or ecological layer uh, on the landscape. And then the fact that it would become more wildfire resilient was just a plus next to it, right? Sort of the community right away gets a trail or sort of a beaver uh, habitat. And then on top of that, it's uh, it's more fi uh, wildfire resilient. So sort of this this uh, connection between wildfire and, and this, yeah, it's potential, like you uh, mentioned, was something that, that is quite interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A um, couple more things that I'm seeing in the chat that I'll pick up on here. Um, Rachel asks about residents near streams or rivers. Um, there is a concern that property might be taken by the streams. If we slow down the water, spread it out, there are going to be areas that flood sometimes that, you know, does that, does that end up um, impacting their property lines, property rights, boundaries, that kind of thing? Is it more temporary, permeable? Um, what are your thoughts on that? And what have you learned from the uh, Dutch example? Sure. Yeah, the, the Dutch are all about... Uh permeability, uh, especially sort of giving room to the to the landscape and in their case, water systems to breathe. So these flood channels that I had shown in, in uh, sort of an earlier slide are sort of just temporary moments uh, when the river uh, floods, then you have sort of this, this experience that's unlocked maybe just for a day or for a weekend 
Uh, so residents rush out to sort of jump over the stones because it might be the only chance they have uh, for the next couple of years. Um, and with these uh, sort of with this zone, I did take into account topography lines. Um, so sort of these blue zones do actually follow uh, topography lines in the area. Um, and then next to that sort of streamside vegetation uh, as well. The sort of specific sort of transition between public and private here, I, I sort of uh, stayed away from because I uh, had time constraints to my project, but that is sort of a, an element that I'm really interested in is sort of looking at how that uh, transition uh, could happen uh, in reality. Uh, but in this site, there weren't any um, residential structures sort of within the flooding zones uh, that I proposed. But again, sort right. of these, this specific intervention here uh, is sort of more conceptual and would really need to be worked out uh, as well. Yeah, yeah, great point. And, you know, we've done, um, CPRW and some of our partners have done a few of these projects on both private and public land where, you know, we are putting in those post-assisted log structures and those kinds of things to uh, help the help the stream deposit sediment. And, you know, Rachel, to your question, it's a, it's a really interesting thought. You know, these are, I guess, the temporal nature, the um, temporary nature of the flooding and the water movement is one thing to highlight there. Um, we have a project up on the upper part of the Elkhorn where, you know, I was out there in at the end of May around Memorial Day and the entire valley was soaking wet. And then, you know, that changes your experience of it, but it also changes where you can move on the landscape and where the water's going and that kind of thing. And that would have to be, of course, carefully designed if there were uh, homes or roads or things like that nearby uh, with an, an eye to infrastructure. But then of course that dries out later in the year and different areas are wetter and different areas are drier. And then you really start to see the change in the vegetation as it adapts to those differences. So lots to think about there. Again, kind of that idea of a little less control, a little more benefit, but also with an eye to, you know, let's not flood anybody's houses when we're designing these things, that's for sure. Um, there was an interesting question in here about community input. And uh, how did you get that community input? Who'd you talk to? And how was that integrated into your project? Yeah, yeah. So um, besides sort of through through Sarah's extended network, uh, having contact with with people like uh, or organizations like CPRW, I also uh, visited the site uh, mm -hmm. two times. Um, so sort of really rented a van, drove around, camped, fished, spent really like a day sort of in, in these forests and uh, and getting to, to know it. Um, and also part of that time really then uh, being in Red Feather Lakes, where you know you would go to the um, to sort of the local bar and convenience store and talking with some residents, um, not specifically about sort of the the uh, specific plan you see here, but more generally gauging sort of their uh, reactions and attitudes to wildfire. And I was, uh, um, yeah, what really stuck with me is sort of how uh, sort of how deeply these residents sort of uh, feel connected with these landscapes. A lot of them really live here or, or move here. Uh, because of the the landscape, it's really sort of an elemental uh, component for them. Um, but also, sort of from the residents who I talked with, uh, everybody was also very realistic uh, and sort of uh, open eyed about living in a wildfire prone landscape. Uh, I expected, honestly, to encounter a bit more resistance uh, to the idea of giving wildfire more room to breathe, uh, and was surprised actually that that everybody I talked with. Uh, unless they were too shy to say otherwise, I found it, it uh, to be um, sort of a yeah, very credible idea. Um, and I also sort of noticed that there's really an untapped um, potential there when it comes to community engagement uh, with the forests. Um, one resident sort of described, and I hope I'm not offending uh, too many people here, as the U.S. Forest Service as a feudal landlord because they sort of wanted to be part of this landscape that they lived in, but they kind of had this uh, exterior organization that was managing it for them and actually kept them from having a deeper relationship with the landscape. So sort of uh, conversations and moments like this sort of open up my eye to the potential of involving the community, not only to sort of have more hands on deck, but also sort of uh, allow the community to maybe engage with their landscape in ways that they're not uh, able to or allowed to do now. So really in a, in a more hands-on way. Great, great. Maya, hi, thanks for joining us. Let's see you got your hand up. Yeah, hi. Uh, Jacob, thank you so much for this. This was just such a beautiful um, presentation. I am totally fascinated by your research project. Um, I just 
uh, yeah, I just love your ideas. They're so creative. Um, I really appreciate the way that you, as you were just saying, um, have kind of come up with with ideas for giving agency to communities um, as part of uh, cultivating a different kind of relationship with the landscape. I love the way that you've integrated um, designs that you know go so far as to introduce a uh, burn aesthetic. The I love the implicit acknowledgement that um, and kind of alluding to what Daniel was saying earlier too that a lot of the public, even those of us who live in these um, these these forested rural landscapes, are not necessarily used to living in burned landscapes. And that actually, if we want to live, we want to cultivate living with wildfire. We have to cultivate a different kind of relationship with these landscapes. And I love the way that you have done that in your in your work. Um, and I also love, uh, I do have a question, but I just have to. <laughs> I will, I, I'll take all the compliments. Thank you. <laughs> um, I also love how you think about, um, I guess, another way of providing agency to communities through subverting this idea of what it means to be a firefighter and um, thinking of more than human firefighters like the beaver, but also again, incorporating community into, into that idea. Um, so just absolutely love your your concepts and designs. And um, yeah, I was also curious, uh, similar to the other question, how you had actually engaged the community in some of these designs. Um, and I'm curious what kind of reception you've gotten from the, the feudal landlord <laughs> for service or um, and also, you know, just from other other agencies that you've that you've interacted with as part of this process. Yeah, well, I have to say this is the first moment that I'm presenting the project to uh, to sort of such a big group here, including I think some some local residents. Um, and so my last contact with the sort of when when I was traveling was um, sort of at at a point where sort of my my general sort of structure and, and approach uh, was sort of determined, but sort of the exact uh, spatial sort of elaborations uh, I didn't have yet. So I sort of had these these principles uh, that I mentioned, but then sort of exactly where these fire um, fire breaks would come, for example, I hadn't determined that yet. Um, so that's something I'm actually very curious to hear more about from maybe the residents who are here to sort of see uh, how this plan, which is which is quite conceptual, really lands uh, for them uh, and where it could maybe grow uh, or adapt as well. So in short, uh, this this is the moment uh, where I was hoping to get some of that feedback because I think it's uh, yeah can only uh, strengthen the project. We're running up on a couple minutes left here. I do see one more I'll highlight in the chat. And then if anybody else wants to raise their hand, any community members or anything like that have final thoughts, love to hear them. Um, Tom asked about prescribed burns and uh, the, the way that we've done prescribed burns so far in the landscape has really been a little further down in the montane where um, there is a lot of less fire intensity, uh, le you know, shorter flame lengths and that kind of thing in our prescribed burns. But Tom was asking about uh, successful prescribed crown fires. And that's, you know, that's kind of a tough one. You're right. Um, that does raise a lot of eyebrows when you see some really uh, good fire behavior like that. But it has been done. Some of those areas around Red Feather North uh, that were burned just a few years ago, 2019-ish, um, those were a little further outside of the community, uh, a little further north, but they did get some really good fire behavior in those where it torched out, you know, some big pockets of trees and that kind of thing. So I think that's an interesting point. You know, what what is the limit of a community's tolerance of seeing some of this management uh, that you're proposing here, Jacob? Do you think people would be up for seeing flames that close to to the communities um, or is that further down the line what do you think yeah what i what i proposed sort of in in this site was really kind of using the the burn scar or burn perimeter of the cameron peak fire kind of to our advantage because a lot of this forest was really burnt and is starting sort of from from scratch right with with succession so what i envisioned here in this timeline as well is sort of that community involvement and hopefully community um, acceptance of wildfire kind of grows 
with the forest, right? You sort of have a period as the forest establishes before uh, you need to even start with prescribed burning. Um, and so for this site specifically, I sort of, uh, well, at least I, I am hoping that the community sort of comes to a point where they have this uh, sort of longstanding relationship with this landscape uh, and appreciation uh, for wildfire uh, through which they might sort of uh, be more open to uh, uh, prescribed burning. Um, but that being said, I think having crown fires close to your home is, uh, is, is, is cannot be a comfortable experience. And I think you'd really need to look with residents and also with the specific conditions and sort of variables of, of that site, uh, how you could do that in a way uh, that also uh, is safe uh, and, and also perceived as safe uh, for this community. I think that would be very essential in this process. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We are at 12 o'clock. Unless anybody has any final thoughts, I'll say thank you so much, Jacob. Really appreciate it. This is a great conversation starter for a lot of us here at the, the beginning of the year when a lot of us are thinking projects and work plans and, and how do we get this stuff done? I think this is a, a really good focus uh, to keep us thinking about what this really means to live in a fire adapted landscape. I believe Megan said she would record and post this up on the Fireship website. So please check for it there here pretty soon. And congratulations on wrapping up your project, Jacob. Really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate uh, you inviting me out here and uh, for everybody who took uh, some time in their Monday to uh, to listen to me. Um, yeah, and if you have questions that we didn't have a chance to uh, talk about yet, uh, I invite you to, to send me an email or, or contact me uh, so we can continue the conversation. Um, and through this project sort of as a general uh, sort of thing as well as I'm, I'm very interested in sort of finding uh, ways to sort of maybe test some of these ideas together with with sort of the, the different parties working here, um, sort of looking at what you said, indeed, sort of new opportunities for ed uh, nature education, uh, maybe sort of inverting the idea of a community wildfire protection plan into some other kind of plan, maybe an opportunity plan, um, yeah. and sort of maybe exploring together uh, sort of the role that landscape architecture uh, can play uh, for you as well. So I'm, I just like to say I'm very open uh, to sort of continuing the conversation in, in whatever way uh, would be possible. And thank you again for letting me talk. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jacob. We appreciate it. And thank you thank everyone you so for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Megan, for running the show.